Funding Month, presented with Oracle for Startups and American Express, recognizes the stories, lessons learned, and best practices shared by founders and funders around the world. Greetings, greetings, and hello, hello, hello. This is 2021. This is Startup Grind Jacksonville, the host with the mostest, Teresa W. Gamba. I am coming to you virtually today with an amazing longtime partner of mine when I started out being an entrepreneur back in 2014. <laughs> with an amazing team of people that have been constant and true to their brand. I'm coming to you today at Startup Grind for Jacksonville, Florida, but we're local, but we have a global reach. We host thousands of events globally every year. But more than that, Startup Grind is a community. That's what makes us different. We bring like-minded, diverse individuals together to connect, learn, teach, help, build, and belong. We are all about collective collaboration. No competition here. It is all about collaboration. So today I am truly honored and excited to have the SBA North Florida. That is the Small Business Administration. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. The federal government is in the virtual room today. We'll start a grind. We have the lady with the mostest, Miss Rosalind Bryant. She is a lending relations specialist, um, D-I-T-O. I'm going to let her tell y'all what those acronyms mean. And then the most a stool gentleman that I have always heard speak all the time. He's the eco de economic development specialist, Mr. Thaddeus Hammond. Both of these individuals, they are in Jacksonville, Florida. But guess what, y'all? This information is just not for Jacksonville. You have a local small business administration office in your region, in your area. And I just want to highlight North Florida today for our funding month with our amazing global sponsors, Oracle for Startups and American Express Corporate Program for Startups. They're, the, this month with Startup Ground, we are exclusively, they are our exclusive global sponsors. They are presenting, we presenting Oracles for Startup, American Express. We recognize stories, lessons learned, and best practices shared by founders and funders around the world. So these two kings and queens on the live with us today, they're going to tell us some best practices. And that's something we got to master startups and business owners. We got to get this education. We have a new administration. The government is open for business. Y'all keep playing. Teresa going to get all the money for y'all. So let's welcome to the room. Welcome to the virtual stage, Rosalind Bryant. And Thaddeus Hammond. Hi, guys. Thank y'all so much for coming and joining us today, today, today. We, um, by the way, the music is by Acid. We got some Acid Jazz going on. You got to check it out. It is cool, and we're grooving on today. But right now, we got to learn about how to get this money that President Joe Biden talking about the federal government got to give. So I am going to disappear, but I'm going to be present, and I'm going to let Rosalind Bryant do what she do best. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, folks. What I'm going to do, I'm going to start to share my screen so we can get right into it to give you all the good sausage and, and the potatoes and all the good bacon that we have on our plate today. We're going to share it with you. So give me a moment. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to um, get started. Thank you. And, and I think we have it up and I can get started. Yes. Thank you very much. And again, I do apologize. My name is Rosalind Bryant and I am the lender relations specialist for the North Florida office. On behalf of our district director, John Michael Richards and our full North Florida team, 
Um, we would like to thank you for continuing to trust us with providing ongoing assistance for your, for your potential or existing business that you have. And in North Florida, in North Florida, we service 43 of the 67 counties. We go as far as Orlando, then we go as far west, all the way down to um, in the Panhandle area. And we provide assistance to all small businesses, startup, existings, to our lenders, our resource partners that are out there. So we do thank you for um, continuing to trust us with that. Along with our regional offices um, and other district offices, we partner with other organizations, including SCORE counselors, small business development centers, small business centers, our Veterans Business Opportunity Center, and more to advise small businesses on every stage of growth and development. We also partner with federal agencies such as um, work with the Department of Chamber of Commerce to um, help small business deal the international trade. As um, Teresa said in the introduction, she said she's going to let you tell, um, let me tell you what the DITO stands for. And I am the District Office International Trade Officer. So if you have any questions as far as um, exporting, um, international trade, importing, or getting your business involved in that, please reach out to me on that as well. The resource partners um, that I mentioned can help um, with the development of with the, with the development of your business plan. A business plan is a is the foundation of your business. This is something that you want to make sure that you put together and make sure that you have a, 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 a the overall overall of what you plan to do in your business. It's, it's more like a resume, like you revisit your resume and you update it on a year, six months to a yearly basis. That's the same how you're gonna do your business plan. Again, that is a foundation of your business. Some of the things that it should include, if you are looking to borrow funds, it need to include how much you're planning to borrow, what you plan to use the money for, um, how you plan to in inject, how much you plan to inject in the business, what type of collateral you have to offer, um, your fi the financials of your business, um, whether it's projected or the historicals, and the meat and the gravy of your business. All of that should be included in your business plan. Once you have all those that item, all those items down, it is suggested that you reach out to one of our resource partners, which is mentioned that you that is on this slide here. These resource partners will again help you with that business plan, and they can help you get your plan what we call bank ready. It, it helps you put it in a form where it's easy to read for the banks. It is and it and it will include the things that banks are looking for when they're trying to provide funds to you. Also, SB has an online business guide that can also assist you in starting your business. There are 10 steps to this business guide out there. It's conducting, the, um, it's showing, number one, is conducting market research. Two, find your business. Three, choose your business structure. Four, register your business. Five, apply for permit for all permits, license permits that you may need. Six, write a business plan. Again, we're going to, you're going to hear that business plan a lot in our presentation. Seven, pick your business location. That's very important. You want to make sure that you choose the, a good location of your business. Eight, choose your business name. Nine, Get federal and state IDs, excuse me. You want to stay legal, so you make sure you have everything in check. And 10, opening a business account. A business account. It's a business. You should have a business account. That is a must. You should not have business funds going in a personal account. You should not be put, pulling personal funds out of your business account. So you want to open that. So this online business guide will help you kind of review. It has um, samples and it kind of can connect you with what you need to do. And it, it actually will connect you with 
what we call our business plan. All of that is included in, in that. So this is a good guide that can help you when you're trying to start or grow your business. So I know you probably was waiting on this part here, access to capital. Many of you may be looking for additional funds for your business. Know that SBA works closely with our participating financial institutions to assist you. The lender made one of three decisions. One, to approve the loan itself. Two, make the loan with SBA's guarantee, or three, decline it all together. The decision for SBA to become involved is determined by the lender, not SBA. SBA will only become involved if the lender needs our guarantee. So remember, you do business with the bank and the bank does business with us. So, so make sure that you're picking the banking institution. We always say go to the banking institution that you that you do business with that are very familiar with your portfolio. So that is what you want to make sure you do. We have several different loans programs available to small businesses out there. We have our 7A loan program. That loan program goes up to $5 million. The percentage of guarantee, SBA will guarantee 85% for loans that are $150,000 or less and 75% on loans that are $150,000 or more. The benefits to the borrower, long-term financing, improved cash flow, fixed maturity, you have no balloon notes, no pre, pre excuse me, no pre Play, excuse me, no prepayment penalties. Next, you have the 7A small loans. Those loans goes up to $350,000. The percentage of guarantee is the same as the 7A, and as far as the benefit to the borrower, that is the same as well. Just know that our 7A program, that, that is the umbrella, 7A. And then you have different um, programs up under the, that 7A, but usually that is our um, the, seven, the SBA 7A guarantee loan program. Next, you have the SBA Express. That program goes up to $350,000, just so you know. Right now, through December the 31st, that amount has um, been increased to $1 million. So right now, you can get a $1 million um, SBA Express loan. The percentage of guarantee is 50% across the board. And the benefits to the borrower, fast turnaround time, streamlined process, and easy to use lines of credit. You have the SBA Veterans Advantage Loan. Those loans are done through our express lender. So you must find an express lender to work with you. And that's the same as the express loan as far as the guarantee percentage and the benefits to the borrower. We also have our cap lines program. Up under that program, we have a working line, working capital lines of credit. We have a contract lines of credit. We have a seasonal and we have a builder's lines of credit. That goes up to $5 million. The guarantee percentage is the same as 7A, 75%. We would guarantee 75% of the loan of $150,000 or more and 85% on loans that are $150,000 or less. The benefits to the borrower there, if it's a working line, excuse me, if it's working capital, um, revolving lines of credit there, contractors, we can finance the cost um, of the, ma the, machine, the machinery. The seasonal, you have the seasonal working capital that is available there for your needs. And if it's a builder's, the finance, we will finance the direct cost um, that is needed for the um, commercial or real estate structures that you may use. We have the, the Community Advantage Loan Program. This program is done through our mission-focused lenders only. 
that goes up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and it's actually the same the guarantee percentage is the same as the 7a however um, the mission focused lenders that are involved they will provide um, ongoing technical assistance and this is the lenders more so um, kind of um, target the underserved market up under this program we have our 504 loan program that 504 for loan program goes up to um five million dollars it's kind of dependent on the um your project size there the 504 program 50 pro, pro 504 loan program is done through our certified development lenders we all we is it's they have different um the program itself is the same throughout but we always say connect with that certified development um company so they can provide you the best service and as far as um how much you're going to inject in the business if you're going to look for a first mortgage holder they kind of will help you throughout that um with doing that the benefits to the bar when you're using the the 504 which is only for fixed assets or large machinery you have low down low down payment um on that and um long-term financing rate and then it's a full amortization and no balloon notes for the 504 loan program. We have three SBA export products. We have our international trade loan. We have our exporting working capital program, and we have our export, the, our export express loan program. These programs work with our export, our export um, businesses. Up under <clears throat> these programs, you can actually receive a 90% guarantee there. So if you are involved in exporting or importing any type of way, this is a program that you may want to look into to receive that higher guarantee for your fund request. The benefit to the borrower when using these programs is just it it it, it, it helps with its long-term financing with one. Um, you could get additional working capital to increase the, your exporting sale without disrupt disrupting your domestic um, sales, your financing of your business. It's fast turnaround time. You have screen streamline processing there. Um, it's easy to use lines of credit. Um, it actually is it, it's a good program if you're exporting or importing that this is something that you want to look into on um, if for your business and then last but not least we have for our non 7a loans we have our micro loans our micro loan goes up to fifty thousand dollars these the, these loans are made through nonprofit lending organizations um, that provide technical assistance um also with your loan and usually we have a list of those and usually you will go directly to them for the for that micro lender to provide the assistance that you need in applying for that type all the different programs that we um that i spoke of um that we have remember you're working with lending institutions and all the lending institutions, they may have other programs out there that can assist you. So always when you go to those different lending institutions, yes, SBA is, we always say you want to apply for SBA because you're receiving that guarantee loan program. However, make sure when you go in, for one, make sure you're speaking to an a SBA representative, someone that has SBA knowledge. That way you will make sure that you're receiving the best information and they're giving you everything that is offered. Not all branches to a lending institution knows about SBA. So make sure again, you're speaking to your business banker and they have SBA knowledge so they can give you the, um, the do's and the don'ts and the pros and the cons to what would be best for you. You want whatever they're doing for you to benefit your business, not benefit them, but benefit your business. So make sure that you, when you're going in to apply or just find out information, you're speaking to someone with that knowledge. Also, you must be for-profit business. You must show, um, or what we call must have 
what we call and, and the uh, and the lending institutions call um, the five C's: character, capacity, collateral, capital, and know the condition. So character goes along with credit. Owner and operator must be a good credit. Excuse me, a good, must be a good character. Good credit history, bankruptcies, or prior arrest does not prevent you or an individual from applying for financing, but you must go through a clearance process. So if you have that type of issues or having issues, make sure you address that in the beginning because sometimes the clearing process with SBA takes anywhere from six to 10 weeks to be cleared. So you don't want that to be hinder you at the end when it's time to release the funds. So make sure you advise the lender of that. Once that lender say, hey, we're going to work with you. Um, let us know about your business. Let them know, hey, I, I did. I do have a prior arrest or I do have some other issues, character issues out there. And, and if it needs to be cleared, we need to put it on the burner right now. So that's that 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 is the best way to do that. Capacity, management and experience commit committed necessary to successfully operate the business to repay the loan. Collateral. Sufficient collateral pledged to secure the loan. Inadequate, inadequate collateral is not a reason for decline for a um, for us to decline the loan. However, if available and required, refusal to re to pledge the collateral that you have can cause a decline. So, in other words, if you have cars, boats, houses out there, and and the lender say, hey, can you put that up for collateral? And you say no, more than likely it's going to be a done deal. They're going to cancel the deal. If you're not, if you're not, I guess, positive or, or sure about yourself repaying the loan, why should we put our money or our guarantee up for that? So that, that's what you want to look at. Capital. Sufficient funds, including the SBA loan, to operate the business on a sound financial basis. So you want to look at that. Make sure you have that in order. Then condition. What are the local economic conditions and the overall climate, both to your industry and the other industries around where you're trying to place your business location that may affect your business? So make sure where you put your business is where a business needs to be or where that type of you need to be look at that do your work research know as much as you can about the business that you're going to be next door to across the road from up the street from know where the closest business like your business is make sure you know all that when you're you're you're, you're starting a business when you're trying to grow your business know about the other business to know that you're what you're trying to do or what you will do in the future will be an asset to your business Just some key points, some tips, what banks want to know. So on the bank side, usually when you go into the bank and you say, hey, um, my name is Rosalind and I have a business, um, Bryant Industry, and I'm looking to um, get some funds. They want to know how much money you're, you're going to invest, how much you're going to invest in your business or how much you have to invest. They want to know that. They're gonna want to know how much money do you do you um do you need? How how long do you excuse me? How long do you need the money? What are you going to do with the money? When and how you plan to repay the money? And last but not least, they're gonna want to know what will you do if you don't get the money? What if you're not approved for the loan? What would you do now? So you have these tips. So I already have these answers when you're going or answer these questions. This is something you want to know. I know we we look at things and we say, hey, hey, I want the money. I, I think I'm I, I can be approved. I think I got all my my ducks in a row. I'm going to go out here and I'm I'm ready. But you want to answer these questions because these are some very important questions that you need to address before going in and try to to apply for any type of funding or receive any type of funding from anyone. Build a relationship with your lender. That is a must. If you haven't already done so, 
and it's suggested that you reach out to your lending institution and start building a relationship. As a business owner, this should be one of your goals of your business. Even if you're not looking to receive funds currently, you may not need funds right now. You may not need funds. You may not say I would never borrow funds or need any type of funding. However, before this pandemic, I'm quite sure a lot of businesses said that or they felt that way. I have my own money. My business are if my business is doing very well. I don't need no one else money. But look at a lot of the other business now. We need assistance. We all need assistance for our businesses because of the pandemic. So you want to get this started right now. So you may think just because you have been a member or been depositing funds in an institution for years, that's a relationship. No, it's not. That is not a relationship. You're just putting your money in there and that you, that is the bank that when you moved or got there, this probably was closest to you. So you decided to be a member. That is not a relationship. Knowing your business banker, knowing if they would even consider lending you funds or knowing what is needed from you for them to consider lending you fun, funds is a start. So start building a relationship with the lending institution that you do business with. So not knowing whether or not they will participate with you, but not become a surprise to you. So you want to go in there and, hey, find your business banker, tell them, hey, my name is Rosalind, and I think I may need funds from you one day. If I'm if I need funds from you one day, what would you need from me in order for you to do business with me? So they will give you a list of things. You need to get this, 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 this in order. So you'll have that. So you know, or they may say, hey, we don't even lend funds to businesses. We don't do that. So now, you know, that is not the bank that will help you with your funds. So you may want to look into building a relationship with another lender as well. So, you know, you never know what you may need, but build a relationship. That is a must. You would not lend money to someone you don't know. So why would you think they would do the same? So you want to know that. They may have special incentives in the bank. They may have special deals out there. They may have things just for your type of business. You want to know your business banker so they know to pick up the phone or shoot an email to you or call you and say, hey, we got this new um, initiative going on right now. And your business is, is, is one of the business we're looking for. Come on in. This may be something that can help you. So you want to look at all of that. So build that relationship with your business banker so you kind of know what's going on on your money side. If you do not have a lender or you are unable to find a lender, Lender Match can help you. Lender Match is a free online tool that connects um, small businesses with participating SBA approved lenders. So you wanna be ready, you wanna get ready, you wanna have everything available that you need, Um, You want to have your business plan. You want to have um, your financials ready. Um, You want to be able to give that lender whatever they need when they reach out to you. Because when you put in, it's the online tool, you put in a certain amount of information. And what it does, it kind of sends your information out to lenders that have a profile up under Lender Match that are looking for businesses. And if you find a match, what they do, they send your information to the lender within two business days, or usually within two business days, the lender will reach out to you um, if they need to set up an appointment or if they want to see more. And when they reach out to you, they're going to say, hey, um, I got this from Lender Match. Can you send me your business plan and your financials so we can get started? I would like to do business with you. Right there, that's why I say be ready. If you're not ready, you're like, oh, I don't have that. It's going to take me a day or two days. You may have missed a great opportunity for someone to provide assistance to you. So don't just go on in the match to see what you can find. Be ready when you're putting your information in there, because, if, again, you may miss that opportunity if, if, if you cannot provide the information that lender is looking for. And it may, again, that opportunity may not come around again. Now on Lender Match, just in case you do not receive 
a match with a lender, usually they will send you back to the district office. Again, as you know, if you're calling in our area of service, we are your district office. And what we provide, we just provide a list of lenders that have done business with us in the past that can assist you um, with your business plan and um, excuse me, since you with your, your business needs um, when you're applying for the funds. Okay, um, wrap up other service and um, that we have. So we have, we talked about preparing a business plan. That is, that is a, a good deal. And I know on the business plan, you gonna probably say, um, I, I, I know businesses that that do business and is very is very successful, and they say they never had a business plan. Well, it, it's possible. However, you also know every business is not the same. What works for them may not work for you. And usually, when you're trying to get funds from someone, they're going to ask for a business plan. So again, I stress. A business plan is a good idea for all businesses. Put it down in black and white. That way you'll have something to follow to make sure that you're going in the right path or what you, how you want to be or how you want your business to grow. Okay, we talked about building um, a lender, build, uh, finding a lender to participate with you. Um, that's through our lender match again. And we have lenders that have participated with us in the past. We will provide a list of lenders for you, <clears throat> and, and you can use that as a guide. Um, building a relationship with a lender, again, that is a must. That is a must that you want to do. Build a relationship with the lender. Go out there, set an appointment up with your business banker. Let them know that you want to meet up with them and um, tell them about your business and see if it's something that they can help you with. Disaster services. Um, also through our disaster assistance program, which I'm not going to get much into because I think Thaddeus is going to go into it a little bit. SBA provide low interest, long term disaster loans to businesses of all sizes, private, nonprofit organizations, homeowners, and renters to repair, replace uninsured, underinsured disaster damaged property. So these disaster loans are the federal government primary resource for long-term disaster recovery. So to receive assistance from SBA, you usually will um, need to visit directly the SBA's website, sba.gov forward slash disaster. I know I said that fast, but we will provide that information on a, um, a slide. You will get that information. But again, it's www.sba forward slash disaster for disaster loan. They can provide some assistance to you. And then grants. Last but not least, grants. Grants are usually, usually for nonprofit organizations. However, the federal government primary that we when we when you say us as SBA um, participating in grants, usually it's for it's not for startup businesses. Um, it's for or expanding the type of grants SBA usually are in, are connected with um, are offered through research and development. These programs encourage small businesses to, to engage in the federal research and the development. And then for more information on those grants, you will visit the sbr.gov website. Um, however, I know you have heard of and several other grants that we may be providing um, upcoming or providing out. But again, that will talk more on that. Um, and that's what I have. Again, my name is Rosalind Bryant. I know I speak a little fast, but everything I have here, I will provide to Ms. Gamble that you can um, you can work with it. But also everything that I talked about is also located on our website um, in a, just a different form, but it's there. Our website is very user friendly um, and we can provide um, that assistance to you. So again, I am Rosalind. I thank you for your time. And next up, we're gonna have that is. So, Miss Teresa, if you would like to um, switch us over from me to Thaddeus, and Thaddeus will bring up his PowerPoint, and he will go more into the other um, initiatives and programs that we have.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Roslyn. That was some information. I, I think I got about five pages of notes up over here. <laughs> This was some good information. Um, if you all do not take advantage of this information, it's very vital. I like the fact, Bryson, that you talked about the necessity of a business plan. Now, a lot of people now are debating, especially with more innovative or startups that's using the lean startup method where they're moving more mm -hmm. to a business model. Mm -hmm. And when I get that question, I normally ask people. You need to have both because oh. that way I look at the business model is your cliff notes to the business plan, which is your vibe. So that's what I normally tell people, you know, because some bankers, they don't have that time to really flip through the whole thing. And um, and I love the tool that you shared about Linda Match. So let me ask you this. I know SBA has offered a lot of stuff for its classes and preparation. Is there any tools or resources for the business plan. I know years ago, you all used to have a small business plan template on your website. Does that still exist? Yes, that is still out there for if you want to do it yourself. However, um, we have our small business resource partners or small business development center, women business center, which I mentioned in the beginning, they will help them what we always say call get bank ready. You want to get it ready. You want to be in the form what the bank um we'll be looking for when it's going out so they help so it's fine for you to do a business plan and have it um what we call a draft mm -hmm. and then that you're getting someone to put the second eyes on it before you present it to someone but you should know your business plan so like you said that that online tool or that 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 template out there that is good for you to know as well not just go and pay somebody to do a business plan. So let me tell you, just when we used to process in the office, and when, when I was a loan officer, when loans came in, because they've been centralized now where they're going to a different central location, and I was a processor, the first thing I used to pull from that application package was the business plan. And I read that business plan from the first page to the last, whether it was 10 pages, 500 pages, whatever it was, I read. From that, then I pulled the lender's summary of this business. From those two documents, I had made my decision whether or not I was going to recommend approval or pull back from it. Hmm. You never get this. Sometimes you never get to see the person who's going to make that approval. Your business plan is going to do that. You telling you, yes, you got that online and you're talking back and forth with that lender, but that lender cannot give that to the person who's going to make the final decision. They're going to look at what's in black and white. So that's why I say you need a business plan. And that business plan got to be got to be able to sell that person who's going to make that final approval. And I made my decision. So what and the reason why I was looking for the, the bank's summary. I was looking for them to, that addendum to justify what I saw wrong in that business plan. Because mm -hmm. usually they say if they say they had, for example, they the, the collateral was not enough, but that bank, if they're doing it with it, they say, okay, they don't have enough collateral. However, they have this, 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 this. And then once I made my decision, I put it together. I had, now I'm looking at your financials just to mix it up. But your business plan is the key. So make sure you have that. Put it in black and white so someone can read it who you probably would never touch, never talk to, never see. That's making the final decision whether or not to move forth on your request. Awesome. Awesome. That is um, that's good to know. I got some more questions, but I want to hear what Mr. Dad has got to say right now. Because um, um, I got emailed a whole bunch of questions, but I'm going to put a pin right now. Right now, coming to the stage, we're going to have Mr. Thaddeus Hammond, the economic development specialist. He is going to give us some updates with this new American Rescue Plan, some different programs, especially for our food entrepreneurs. I took a sneak peek online and looked to try to see what was new coming, but I know he has the inside knowledge of what is coming down the pipe and how we, after Ms. Rosson, to tell us what we need to do to be better bank ready. Now, Mr. Thaddy is going to tell us what to do, how we position ourselves to take advantage of that government funding. All right, Mr. Thaddy, are you ready, sir? I heard you. Thank you so much for all that energy, Teresa. Boy, I don't know if I can pull this off. 
Yes, wow. you can. You got it. You wow, got wow, it. Wow, wow, I am so pleased to be here. Thank you for the warm, uh, heartfelt introduction. Um, I feel your energy. And uh, for those of you on the line, like Rosalind, um, uh, I'd just like to share on behalf of our district director, thank you so much for um, inviting us to participate in Startups Grind Speaker Series today. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you about it, and I'm going to tell you what I told you. So what we're going to talk about is the SBA, some of the SBA's programs and services. Rosalyn covered some of them, and I'm going to cover uh, government contracting. I'm going to cover um, some, some, uh, some detail on grant um, information and disaster assistance. And then we're going to talk about um, some of our initiatives, the agency initiatives. And uh, then we'll get into the, well, Rosalyn gave you the meat and potatoes. I guess I got a little bit of dessert for you. And so we'll get into the... Um, American Rescue Plan Act and um, and the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, uh, PPP first and second draw loan from the Economic Recovery Act, as well as targeted idle and uh, and targeted uh, I'm sorry targeted idle advance. So that being said, um, as uh, Teresa mentioned, I'm a an economic development specialist in the North Florida District Office. I've also worked as a business opportunity specialist uh, in both the Washington well actually three areas. Washington Metropolitan Area District Office, uh, the North Florida District Office here in Jacksonville, and as the lead BOS out in New Orleans uh, and the Louisiana District Office. So, so got background on government contracting. We'll talk a little bit about that. But um, suffice to say that, you know, we're really pleased to be out here helping as many small businesses as possible. Uh, but we couldn't do it without the reach and, and support of our resource partner network and our partner agencies and entities. So uh, Rosalind talked about resource partners, and I'm just going to touch on some of the other initiatives. Um, we have a rural initiative, so our rural community is not left out and doesn't feel left out by the federal government. Um, we engage with them and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Development Team. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in Northwest Florida mostly with uh, most of our rural entities, such as uh, Opportunity Florida and the North Florida Economic Development Partnership and the Rural Economic Development Initiative. So. We're deeply engaged and involved in Rosalind, of course. Whenever we call her, I bless her because she's always there for us, uh, providing information and updates on our access to capital programs, uh, much needed funding opportunities for folks. So, so thank you for that, Rosalind. And um, we also have an initiative called Opportunity Zones. So opportunity Zones are, are, are those zones. 70% uh, of these Opportunity Zones are set up in what are called, um, and you all have heard of the um, hub zone program, historically unutilized business zone program, but 70% of opportunity zones are located on census tracts um, that are called hub zones. And these opportunity zones provide opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors alike to invest in their uh, community. And so these funds, uh, what happens with these funds is there's economic development. There could be um, some retail development. There could be some single family homes, some multi-family home development. You can use uh, opportunity zones for street paving, lighting, sidewalks, and the like. So <laughs> great, great opportunity for entrepreneurs to engage and empower themselves and have access to capital through the opportunity zone. And and of course, the, the other um, initiative that we are really proud about is our historically black colleges and universities, uh, HBCUs. We are uh, deeply involved with our HBCU network from Florida A&M University up in Tallahassee to Edward Waters College right here in Jacksonville and the Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona. So uh, we engage and support our HBCUs uh, quite a bit and, uh, and certainly always look forward to, uh, to, to touching, touching those partners. Um, Outside of the initiatives, um, Rosalind talked a little bit about disaster, and she said, I'm going to cover, and so it's true. Um, disaster assistance um, calls for any individual in an area where there has been a presidentially declared disaster, you are eligible for services and support. It doesn't matter uh, whether you are a renter, a homeowner, or a business owner you are eligible. So if you are a renter and you lose your, your, your apartment um, or contents of the apartment, you can borrow up to $40,000 to replace the contents of that apartment or house you are renting. If you're a homeowner, you get to borrow up to $200,000 to replace the home and $40,000 to replace the contents of that home. And if you're a business owner, you can get up to $2 million uh, to replace the business. So, so that being said, fast forward to now, and um, there was a presidential declaration last year, 
and it declared the entire United States a disaster area. First time in history, the entire country has been designated a not a disaster. So that being said, um, COVID-19 started and uh, so too did a couple of programs. Uh, these programs we're working on uh, night and day, day and night. And again, I'm sure Rosin can attest to it because we literally answered thousands of inquiries uh, during the time frame last year when uh, the calls came in. But um, but two programs that are still uh, going strong today that started last year, um, we'll get into in a minute. But uh, just PPP, just keep that in the back of your mind and economic injury disaster loan. So, yep, disaster, you can get help, homeowner, renter, borrower. Um, but now fast forward to today you've got this COVID-19 pandemic and all of the support is coming down through two different uh acts um but before i get to that i just want to spend a minute or two on what to me is um the best kept secret in federal government and that's our federal government contracting programs we don't have any minority contracting programs but um these programs are um, programs where it doesn't matter what you look like, as long as you are eligible and qualified for program participation, you can become certified for one of these four programs and receive the benefit of engaging with us. Now, if you have a certification in a certain um, program, does that mean you're guaranteed a federal government contract? No, all that means is you have a license to hunt now. Now, if you decide not to load your weapon and go after that bear, it's up to you, the bear's gonna eat you, right? So remember, it doesn't matter what certification you have, it does no good if you don't have relationships established with folks in the federal government where that are in your target market space. It doesn't help you if you don't have partnerships and alliances with like people in your industry, so that when the government says, hey, I've got this large procurement and I need you to bid on it, um, all too often small businesses they don't, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the bandwidth, the breadth and depth of resources to satisfy customers' requirements. Therefore, you must build those relationships inside the wire and partnerships and alliances outside the wire. So we have four programs. First one is the Woman-Owned Small Business Program. It is a phenomenal program. Um, there is no statutory authority for the uh, Woman-Owned the Hub Zone and the SWO programs. So uh, they're not business development programs like 8A. Therefore, there's no statutory authority, which means for any sole source that's given uh, or awarded in this program, all the government has to do, a contract officer has to do, is provide a justification and approval. Uh, you do that, and then you're off, off to the races. But as long as you own, manage, and control the enterprise by at least 51% U.S. citizen, then you can become certified in the woman-owned small business program. Just go to beta dot certified dot sba dot gov uh create a log create your login credentials um create an account and then upload all the documents and information it's real easy if you feel as if you don't you know have the time to upload the documents there are four certified third-party certifiers who are eligible to upload the documents for you per the sba those four entities will take your information, they'll upload the documents, and once, com once it's complete, they will then issue you a certificate. The only individuals in the one on Small Business Program who, who have a certificate are those individuals who paid, and yep, you have to pay those third-party certifiers, who paid a third-party certifier to certify them uh, for the program, you'll get a certificate from them. Otherwise, if you do it yourself, you won't get a certificate, but you will be, be certified nonetheless. Uh, but great program, um, market your services to any federal agency. They know and understand what that means. The next program is our hub zone program, our historically underutilized business zone program. That program is unique in and of itself simply because um, hub zones are located, typically located, I'll say, in rural and urban areas where there's high unemployment and high poverty, right? And so the whole gist of the program is to uh, spur economic development in those areas. Um, and what happens with a hub zone firm, if you open up a business in that area, then the uh, economic multiplier comes into effect. Um, and so if I've got a business here, then 
the dry cleaner gets business, the grocery store gets business, the restaurant gets business, Mr. Phil's gas station gets business. So, so dollars are turned over in the community. People are, are happy about that. And that's the whole point of the Hub Zone program. So as long as your principal place of business is located in a Hub Zone, and 35% of your employees reside in a Hub Zone, in a Hub Zone in America, doesn't matter where, then you could qualify for the program. Remember what I said earlier, you had to be eligible and qualify for program participation on all of our programs. Third is the Service Disabled Veteran Home Program. That's not administered by the SBA. That's a Department of Veteran Affairs program. So simply go to uh, www.va.gov forward slash vetbiz. You want to get into the vetbiz database, um, certify yourself, upload your documents and information. And I'll tell you, if you are a veteran, first of all, if you're a veteran, uh, raise your hand. Th thank you so much for your service. We appreciate all you've done for us. Um, but for those of you who are veterans, you're missing out on opportunity. Just about every contract under $4 million that comes out of the Department of Veteran Affairs, it goes to a small business. And it typically goes to a service disabled veteran owned small business first. And if they can't find a service disabled vet to do the work, they'll go to a veteran owned small business. So, so again, uh, check out the website, check out the Department of Veteran Affairs. It's a wonderful program. Uh, last but not least, the fourth program that I'm going to talk about is it is the best kept secret in the federal government. Don't tell too many people now, all right? Uh, we want to keep it a secret from those folks that want to take advantage of it. But the 8A Business Develop Development Program, it is by far the best uh, government contracting program there is. There is statutory authority in the 8A program. Uh, it is uh, Congress mandates this program uh, run every year. And it is an executive level training program for socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. So that means if you know if you're a member of one of the five social groups who the government has automatically deemed to, to be uh, discriminated against and socially uh, disadvantaged, uh, Hispanic American, Black American, uh, Native American, which includes uh, Alaska Native, Hawaiian Native, um, Asian Pacific American, the subcontinent Asian American, you are automatically, automatically qualified under the social disadvantage piece of the program. Remember, you have to be both um, socially and economically disadvantaged for program participation in the 8ABD program. Uh, so second piece of that is, uh, what is economic disadvantage? Well, uh, all that means is as long as your adjusted net worth is less than $750,000, your total assets are less than $6 million, and your AGI, or average adjusted gross income or salary is less than $350,000 over the last three years, then you qualify as someone who is economically disadvantaged. Now, if you don't meet the criteria for social disadvantage, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't, you don't qualify for, for the program. Um, if you show by preponderance of the evidence that it's more likely than not that you've been discriminated against, then you can apply. That means if you have some sort of a uh, disability, 40% loss of sight or hearing or what have you, if you are a white female, you can apply for, for the program. So great program. Uh, last year, the federal government spent about um, $500 billion on goods and services, and um, they have a goal each year that they must meet. 23% of all federal government contracts must go to small businesses. Um, of that 23%, 5% must go to uh, small disadvantaged businesses or 8As. 5% must go to women-owned small businesses, 3% must go to hub zone small businesses, and 3% must go to service disabled veteran-owned small businesses. So that's 16% of that 23% number that's carved out. And uh, in the federal government space, we have teeth in those laws. There's a law. There's a scorecard that comes out every year, uh, every quarter. These federal agencies are rated on how close they came to attaining the goals. Well. Um, the only goal we didn't meet this past year was the service disabled veteran. I'm sorry, the hub zone goal, simply because hub zone has been difficult. I think we did something like 2.8% out of the 3% goal, but women owned for the first time in three or four years, we, we exceeded that goal. Um, small disadvantaged business, of course, blew it out of the water. And, and of course, service disabled, uh, we did about 4%. So, so we're really pleased that um, we're meeting the goals and, and uh, helping so many um, small businesses. The 8A program here in North Florida, there are about 110 firms in our portfolio. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how much activity is going on in Northeast Florida, 
or in the North Florida district office, um, we were offered over $900 million in sole source and competitive 8A contracts last year. I'll say that again, almost a billion dollars. Think about that now. Of the 110 uh, firms that we have, I would venture to say only about 75 or 80 received an 8A award, which means a lot of firms were repeat um, um, uh, contract award winners. So I say that to say this, if you are um, an individual, been in business two years or more, you own managed control enterprise by 51% uh, uh, collectively or, in, or by yourself, if you are a U.S. citizen, if you have good character, um, you you can quali you can be uh, become a participant in the 8A program. Um, three ways in which you can be awarded um, a contract in the 8A program, and then I'm going to shift to uh, to what we were talking about earlier. First way is any contract that's awarded under the Simplified Acquisition Procedures Threshold, a SAP threshold of $250,000, is a simple purchase order. They you know the government. Uh, let's say Roslyn's out there marketing the NAFX Southeast, and they say, hey, I've got a little renovation job for you. It's only $200,000. They send an email to us. The SBA looks at the, the individual firm owner and says, yep, oh, firm owner's in good standing with the SBA's North Florida District Office and can accept this purchase order for renovation services. Send it back over. They call you in, sign a contract. You go to work, $200,000. You didn't bid against any competition. There's no competition, right? It's just you. It's a self-marketing business development program. That's what the 8A program is. So uh, remember I said you got, you, you're getting a license to hunt. Again, if, if you don't want to uh, lose out, I suggest you, you, you hit the ground running. So second way in which you can be awarded a contract is through the sole source mechanism. And the way that works is any contract above $250,000 and below four million dollars, um, a, a an official um, offer letter has to come to the district office, and then we review the offer letter, make sure that you're in compliance with the program regulations, make sure your financials are up to date, make sure you completed your annual review, and if so, we'll send uh, an acceptance letter to the contracting officer. They'll then contact you. You'll come in, negotiate. Uh, and before you know it, you walk out with either a two, three, or four million dollar contract, or anything less than or above two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. But you walk out without bidding against competition. And here's the analogy I'll use: uh, for those of you who like fishing, right? Uh, in the ocean, you got all types of fish, and and and, and you got millions uh, to choose from out there, right? Well. In business, you got to compete against large business, small business, medium-sized business. You got to compete against hub zones, service-disabled vets, veteran-owned, women-owned, 8As. I mean, other small businesses. There's a ton of competition out there. Sharks out there. Well, in the 8A BD program, we're going to take you out of that ocean, that Atlantic or the Pacific, or wherever you are, even in the Gulf of Mexico. We're going to take you out, and that little pond that's behind your your house back there. That's what it's gonna be like for you. Because now the only people you'll compete against are individuals in the 8A Business Development Program. Well, how many NAICS codes do we have? Uh, and NAICS codes is North American Industry Classification System Code, right? And that tells us what type of industry you're engaged in. So let's say you're 236220, which is general construction services. If you're uh, in the construction industry or you know any services that relate to that industry, then guess what? You only compete against people with that next code. Everybody in our portfolio, all 110 firms, don't bid on contracts for construction. Conversely, if you're in the health services or marketing or general administrative services, guess what? Only a handful of firms are in those industries. If you do uh, trash hauling or jet fuel, everybody in, in those services in the portfolio, you get, where, get my drift? But guess what? The federal government, we buy everything from Apple to Xylophone. So no matter what you do, it doesn't matter what, if you service it, uh, purchase it, uh, produce it, or produce it rather not purchase it, we'll buy it. So sharpen your pencils, uh, learn more about our 8 ABD program. It is a great program. It's a nine year program. Uh, it's a business self-marketing business development program. And uh, 
Anything over $4 million is the third way. Anything over $4 million is a competitive award. And like I said, you're in the pond now. You only compete against people like you. And when you go after those competitive 8A contracts from $4 million to $50 billion or $100 billion, you only compete against people like look like you. They're in the 8A program. They have the same next code. They have the same type of revenue you have. So the plan, all I'm saying to you is the plan feels level. Uh, very much so it's level. So um, keep that in mind as you go forward. And um, and so I'm going to, I guess I have to reach over and grab this mouse and see if I can't uh, share my screen for you all. Let me do this here. Let me take that down. I'll put that up. And let me see here if we can. Can you see that yet? There we go. All right. Okay, there it I, is. I think it's coming up. Yes, it's coming up. these things down here. Uh, you all bear with me while it comes up. No, you're fine, Mr. Thaddeus. That was um, good information earlier. I was okay. taking notes. All right. Well, useful and helpful. We um, we appreciate. All right. I think that'll do it, and I think we can move forward. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can see it. Good, good, good. Well, again, um, I appreciate you all hanging in there with me. And uh, so I'm going to change up from the SBA's programs and services and our initiatives to what most of you came here for, which is uh, some of our loan programs and payment and grant programs. So we're going to discuss briefly uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. You'll hear me refer to it as PPP. Rosalyn talked about debt relief on the 7 and 504 microloan program. So uh, we'll, we'll just skip over that one. Uh, but it's just a, a three-month uh, relief on those loans. Payment, uh, principal and interest still accrues on those loans, but it's something that's automatic, nothing you need to do. Uh, economic Energy Disaster Loan or IDLE and a targeted IDLE advance. Uh, there is also a supplemental targeted IDLE advance that's coming, and that's uh, half of what the IDLE targeted IDLE advance is. Should have been your operator's grant. We can't talk too much about that. That program is getting ready to launch. Uh, real soon. It's a competitive process. Therefore, um, we don't want to um, uh, provide any uh, undue uh, advantage to anyone um, by getting into any detail on that particular program. Uh, also coming soon, Restaurant Revitalization Grant. There is some information that's up, in, up on the system right now. Um, the system will be um, open, I think, for, for um, business on the 30th to review, and uh, the applications will be in the portal on the 3rd. So you can go out there on the 30th and kind of start figuring out what it is you have to have in order to apply for this particular program. So here's some of the top takeaways from the Economic Aid and American Rescue Plan Act. Um, Remember last time out when we had the uh, PPP loan and the covered period was either eight or 24 weeks? Well, now if you receive a PPP loan, you can um, choose a covered period between eight and 24 weeks. So it doesn't matter if you say, okay, well, I want to pay this uh, loan back in 10 weeks. Well, your COVID period is 10 weeks, so two and a half months from the time of initial disbursement, you go back to your bank and say, hey, I'd like to apply for loan forgiveness. Or if you want to push it out um, 
you know, to the 24 week mark or six months, then of course you can push it out 24 weeks and uh, utilize the funds for that covered period for the stated purpose and, uh, and then move forward. Um, please remember that um, this particular loan is no longer going to subtract uh, PPP from the idle advance. Remember last time out, whenever you went and applied for PPP in addition to idle, you received an idle advance or whether you receive idle or, or, or not, but you received the idle advance, they subtracted the idle advance from your PPP loan. Well, that doesn't happen any longer. Uh, that's not going to happen any longer. So um, that's a good thing. But that's no longer the case. So if you're a Schedule C filer, remember uh, the first iteration, uh, people were really upset, uh, especially those individuals who were independent contractors, sole proprietors and the like, those Schedule C filers, right? Even if you had an LLC uh, and you, you looked at, and you know, a lot of accountants or, or partner entities or resource partners were helping you and you had to look at the IRS form 1040 and then you look down at line 31. Remember that line 31 was the, 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 the one where if you had a zero for your net profit or a negative number, you were not eligible for a PPP loan. Um, the SBA took all that into account. They, they um, looked at these 1040 Schedule C filers and, and, and thought that looking at gross receipts can help you a lot more so than net profit can. So so we're now looking at line seven on the IS form 1040, the gross income, and uh, and that has helped qualify so many more Schedule C filers. So that, that's good. Now, if you'd already if you've already submitted an application using the old form, you can't go back and say, hey, I want to use the Schedule C that which is in essence the SBA form 2483 is the old form. And now the 2483C is for the Schedule C holders. A 2483 SD is for for a second draw filers. Uh, if you're a, a second draw uh, individuals who want to get a second loan under PPP. Um, now, if you did by chance uh, submit your um, application prior to the third of March this year, um, it's been over a month and a half. You still might be able to withdraw, or cancel the old form. It depends on how fast they process these forms. But just, I would ask the question, but if it's been you know this long, chances are they probably processed it. And if it's been processed already, then um, you, know, you can't withdraw it or cancel it, so you can use the new form. So they've expanded eligibility excuse me, eligibility and expanded uh, uh, and clarified what that means. So in order to, um, you know, help as many people as possible, um, what the SBA has done is eliminated restrictions um, for business owners who had non, prior, well, prior non-financial fraud felony conviction. Um, if you have been delinquent or defaulted on federal student loan debt. Um, there, you know, there are provisions that allow you to receive a, a PPP loan. And if you um, are lawfully in the U.S., we'll allow you to use your I-10 uh, as an identifier or your individual taxpayer identification number. So exactly what is the first draw PPP loan? Everyone on the call right now, um, you pretty much know what that means and what it is. Um, you know, you have to, you must have been in business by February. Um, it was, there was a time when the COVID period was either eight or 24 weeks. You can choose uh, which uh, number of weeks or which number of months you'd like to use for a COVID period. Um, there are additional entities now, entities now eligible for participation in this program, and eligible expense, expenses have been uh, expanded. So remember, the um, 
the allocation of payroll to non-payroll costs still stays the same. So 60% of, you have to use 60% of your PPP loan, first to second draw on payroll costs, and 40% must be used on non-payroll costs, which include mortgage interest, rent, lease payments, uh, and utilities. And utilities include everything from uh, water, cable, sewer, cell phone, gas, uh, light, if I, if I didn't say it, um, transportation, all of that. They also are including certain uh, covered operations expenditures, like let's say you made a payment for business software or cloud computing services um, you know, that facilitates the operation. Um, or let's say you are uh, purchasing some um, tracking system for payroll or human resources, um, supplies and inventory for the business. Well, that's allowable now under non-payroll costs. Um, if you were in an area last year during the summer or the spring, uh, when we had the civil unrest and your business was burned, looted, or destroyed uh, in, in some manner and you weren't covered, then um, you can be covered and use uh, and, and, and recoup costs under the non-payroll cost side of the, the equation here. So, um, and then there are covered supplier costs. Uh, if you say you, you have a supplier of goods and uh, and it's a purchase order or a contract, you made an expenditure uh, pursuant to the contract or purchase order. Well, as long as it was in effect at the time of the covered period, um, even if it's there are perishable goods involved, you can recoup those payments as well. So, uh, but again, it has to be in effect during the covered period. Uh, in order for you to to claim that under that particular section, and then there's worker protection expenditures, or, or as they say, covered worker protection expenditures, um, and all that means simply is if you are um, doing something to stay in compliance with requirements that are or guidance issued by HHS, CDC, or OSHA or any equivalent um, requirements that uh, were issued by any state and local government here or wherever you are, um, then, you know, you can recoup the cost of building uh, barriers, uh, building a drive-through, putting up plexiglass dividers, uh, buying PPE for your employees, uh, any indoor expansion of indoor outdoor spaces uh, for your business, and, uh, and so any signage and, and the like for uh, social distancing, all those costs um, you can now claim under the covered worker protection expenditures portion of non-payroll costs. So, so those are just some of the covered eligible expenses. Now, the program ends on May 31st, 2021, or whenever the funds have been exhausted. I think we'll be around to May 31st. Don't know whether this is true or not, um, but chances are they may extend the program again. Uh, we don't know, but all we know is we'll be out here helping as many people as we can. Um, but one thing I didn't mention up front about this and something that Rosalind touched on in her presentation, with the PPP loan, the first place you must go to is your bank. Go to your banker, start with your bank, finish with your bank. The SBA does not have access to those banking systems, right? They um, approve the loans, they disperse the loans, and they also deny you the loan. All the SBA does in this whole process is guarantee the loan once they make an approval. Uh, go over to us and then, you know, we'll do our back-end compliance check, back compliance check and uh, push it back out to the banker and, uh, and then they'll disperse funds. But, Always, always, always start with your bank. Don't start with SBA. Um, you know, people call us and, you know, there's nothing we can do because um, you have to communicate with the banker or whatever third party you chose to deal with um, to set up your application. Uh, that's where you have to go. Um, but always, always, always speak with your financial institution or your bank first. All right. So remember, um, before 
nonprofit organizations, 501c3, and veterans organizations, uh, chambers of commerce, 501c6s are new now. Um, and, um, and, and these entities, as well as destination housing organization, organizations and housing cooperatives, they are still eligible. Um, so if they receive a PPP loan um, and they don't fulfill the obligation on the loan and they say, oh, well, you know, I only used 40% of this on uh, payroll costs and 60% on non-payroll costs, well, 20% of that has to be paid back. So just keep that in mind, it'll be paid back at a 1% interest rate uh, with a 10 month deferment period. So, but, uh, so, but here are all of the um, eligible entities and uh, Second draw PPP loan, right? First draw, you can get up to $10 million. Um, you can ask for forgiveness and there's a 1% interest rate. Well, that, that's still true here, 1% interest rate. However, the maximum loan amount on this second draw is $2 million. So, but you got to have uh, 300 employees or less and um, suffered a 25% reduction in gross receipts over a comparable, over comparable periods uh, or comparable quarters in 2019 and 2020. So what does that mean? All that means is you take a look at Q2 2019 and Q2 2020. If in Q2 2019, your um, gross receipts were 100,000, and in Q2 2020, there were 50,000. You had a 50% reduction in gross receipts. You qualify. Nothing else to see here. And uh, so that's good. So the loan application process, um, the way that works is, uh, and Rosalind talked about it, go to Lender Match and find a lender. Uh, great tool, great tool to use. Um, real, really easy. It's very, just the, the system's intuitive. I mean, you just follow the instructions, follow the prompts and it'll take you where you need to go. Or you can go to sba.gov forward slash paycheck protection forward slash find, um, or use one of our resource partners. Um, you can, you can uh, find the help you need from one, of, one or more of those uh, people. Um, so once you include all your supporting documentation, um, you know, then you complete the application. If you need to, you can get help from your resource partners or from the district office. And then you, um, the tax will be forwarded to SBA and we will uh, issue a loan number. Um, so just remember now that the loan applicants must apply through a participating lender, as I stated. And after lender approval, they submit the application electronically to SBA where a front end compliance check will occur. And I mentioned that a second ago. Uh, in order to reduce the incidence of fraud, a time lapse is gonna occur. So don't get too antsy. Uh, so between the time in which the lender submits the PPP application information to us, and when we provide a loan number back to the lender, uh, it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit. So be patient with us. Um, remember again, May 31st, all applications must be submitted. And I think June the 30th is when they'll process the the last, uh, the, the, the last or the remaining applications that are in the queue. So here, here we are, uh, loan forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> as I stated earlier, we no longer have to worry about um, the idle advance that you received. So this new simplified PPP forgiveness uh, application is really going to affect the vast majority of 2020 PPP loans. About 86% is what we figure. Um, the, the, the loan forgiveness form is only a few pages long, takes about 15 minutes to complete, and it comes with instructions. So just follow the instructions, follow the prompts. Again, it's really easy to, to maneuver through the system. Um, and keep this in mind too. Uh, you know, company and documentation is not necessary uh, to submit your forgiveness request, but you need to retain these documents for your own records for a period of four years. Again, they're not going to ask you for these records, but you must maintain them, keep them for a period of four years. All right. 
and uh, and and that's important. So, <clears throat> any in this second bullet point here, any expenses paid with PPP loan funds are federally tax deductible. So, but but always, 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 when you're dealing with uh, the tax returns and taxes, contact the IRS. Uh, www.irs.gov. Uh, that's, I mean, you must contact them to find out, um, you know, how they look at these things because you could ask us a question about it and we can't answer that. We couldn't answer a question like that because IRS, they've got their own rules. And so you need to get it straight from IRS exactly what the rules are or what the process is for um, tax deductible funds from the PPP loan, all right? And now we're gonna roll over into um, the Economic Energy Disaster Loan, or IDLE. So um, IDLE, where PPP was a um, payroll loan, right? The, the, the whole point of the PPP program is to encourage, <coughs> excuse me, employers to um, keep employees uh, on their payroll at the same rate of pay over a certain period of time. And, and so that's what those funds are used for. IDLE, on the other hand, is a uh, working capital loan. Uh, and you use it uh, to pay any fixed debt, uh, anything that you would normally ordinarily pay um, under normal circumstances if COVID hadn't happened. Um, on the IDLE loan is a, uh, now, this is not a forgivable loan. This loan must be paid back, but there are 30-year terms on this loan, right? 3.75% interest for businesses, 2.75% for nonprofits. Anything over 25,000, you must um, have uh, collateral. Um, and if you are a small business with 500 or fewer employees, or if you meet the definition of small by the size standards and the uh, uh, 13th CFR uh, 121, 200 or 201, whatever it is, um, for private and nonprofit entities, then then you you qualify. And all that size standard means is there are two things, there are two types of, two ways we look at size in the SBA. That is revenue size and employee size. So uh, let's say you're in construction, uh, use that because that's, you know, that's one that has a, a higher number associated with it in terms of revenue. Um, if your average annual revenue over the past five years is less than $36.5 million, you're considered small, a small business. Uh, on the other hand, if you're um, in a manufacturing or supplier-based uh, industry, and you, let's say your next code is 33-3352 or something like that, then uh, we look at the average number of employees over the past 12 months to determine whether or not you're small. And that number of employees could be anywhere from 500 to 1,500 employees. So, so it's 500 employees or fewer for this program, or small under the size standard for your next code. So that's what that means. So this year, um, what they're going to do is, uh, you know, they realize a lot of individuals received uh, these PPP loans, and, um, and a lot of people um, applied for what they thought was more than what was given. All idle loans were capped at one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. There was a reason for that. There were only, there was only so much money in the pot. Uh, in that bucket of money, and uh, the government felt it best if they they do the most for the most uh, amount of people out there. So, so now um, they are increasing the loan, and uh, they're giving you up to 24 months of economic injury uh, and a maximum loan amount of five hundred thousand dollars. So that's going to uh, help a lot of people. And just like the targeted idle advance loan. There's nothing that you need to do. You don't need to um, submit an, uh, an increased request request through reconsideration. Um, the SBA is going to reach out to you directly, and they'll provide an email with information as to what you need to do next, what your next steps are. So 
Don't worry about anything. Um, if you received a loan or, or loans made in, in 2020, uh, then all you have to remember is the first payment is due 24 months from the date of the note. And same thing in 2021, first payments due 18 months from the date of the note. So, so that's going to help quite a few people, I believe. And um, the next targeted light advance. Um, you know, targeted light advance is going to help uh, quite a few people. And the reason it's going to help a lot of people is uh, so many individuals applied for the idle loan last year and they were uh, declined. The loan application was uh, denied. Uh, but if you uh, applied and they denied the loan and you said, okay, they asked you how many employees you have, you say one or two, if there's one employee, they sent you a check to your business banking account for $1,000 saying, you know, unfortunately, we denied the loan, we declined the loan. However, we hope this in some small way helps you out, yada, 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 right? So that idle advance you received was a grant. Use it for working capital needs, but that was the SBA's way of saying, hey, here's a little helps not much. If you had 10 employees, you received a $10,000 check. Well, what they're doing this time out um, is if you have 300 or fewer employees and you live in a low to moderate income uh, community and you suffered more than a 30% economic loss starting, I think, March 2nd last year over an eight week period, then um, you meet the basic criteria needed to uh, receive the funding. And like the, um, um, the PPP, where the, um, I'm not, not PPP, like the idle um, loan, there's nothing you need to do in terms of, you know, increasing the, the, the amount from 150,000 to 500,000. There's nothing you need to do. SBA is already sending out emails. Uh, and uh, I've heard from quite a few people who received emails from the SBA wanting to know if that indeed was, uh, you know, an email from a federal government source. And I let people know it was, it is. And to complete the information that they provide to you. Um, but yeah, if you are, um, you know, in that low income community, 300 fewer employees, 30% economic loss, then you meet the basic criteria for uh, the program. If you received $1,000 last year, the way this works is if you received $1,000 advance last year, the max you will be awarded, uh, well, what you will be awarded is a $9,000 check into your check and business checking account. Um, if you um, applied, and you didn't receive anything last year because uh, funding expired, or we expended all the funds, then you will um, receive a $10,000 check. So, but again, there's nothing you need to do. Uh, don't call anyone. Um, we are currently working again with those individuals who have been identified. We know who you are, we know where you are. So um, that's where we're gonna do it. Uh, and again, I think I mentioned economic losses calculated over an eight-week period beginning March 2nd, 2020 or later, uh, when compared to the previous year. So um, so then all you have to do is just, you know, provide your gross receipts from last year, um, I think three months, and um, the tax grant transcript from the IRS. That's that IRS form 4506T. I know you've heard a lot about that. Um, and if you're interested in uh, finding out whether or not you're in a income community, a low to moderate, moderate income community, uh, let Teresa know and I will share with her the map and uh, you can just pop your address into that map or go to the website and uh, populate it and it will let you know exactly whether you or not you are in one of those communities. So here are some of the items you need to verify eligibility and submit your application. Please, 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 um, you know, th this program, there are only a limited number of dollars for this program. If you miss the boat and you don't submit the information that's required as the information that's requested, you may miss the boat, all right? You, you may miss out. So make sure you, um, you know, you gather all your documents before you um, 
start the application process because if we contact you, there's going to be a, a checklist of items that you're going to have to grab. Grab those items, have them ready, uh, and make sure you do a thorough check, uh, a thorough review of those items, or as we call it, call it screening. Screen the package thoroughly to make sure everything you have is, is on the checklist. Everything on the checklist is what you have in your hands, rather. So tax returns, uh, month of gross receipts, and any completed months for this month, uh, and of course they want your receipts from 2019, 2020. Um, want to make sure that the information on your original idle application is still accurate. Make sure you hadn't moved anywhere or done, you know, done anything else to the company, changed the company name, bank account, or you know, anything of that nature. Uh, here's that word 4506T again. Uh, the IRS has this form, and we want to obtain uh, a transcript of your tax return is what this is. And that's what it provides. It gives us the opportunity to get the, the uh, 2019, 20, well, probably 18, 19, and 20, in this case, 19 and 20 tax returns. So make sure you complete that and, uh, and be thorough about it. Okay. Now, the application process. The, the targeted idle advance uh, application has 23 yes or no questions that must be completed. You got to confirm, I can't stress this enough, you got to confirm information submitted on the idle advance program as well as monthly gross receipts for 2019, 2020, they check out. Um, you make sure you got your bank account information ready and confirmed. Uh, make sure you got, you know, information like official bank name, uh, checking account. Make sure that checking account, you know, uh, is has to have uh, access for ACH payments. Um, make sure you can receive the payments. That's important because some people don't have ACH um, um, uh, activity or or access, and and they'll miss out. So. Um, Another thing, the business must be in your legal name, um, and it has to match what's on your application. I'm giving you these points because these are things that we look for. The address and phone number's got to match what's entered on the application. Um, you know, whatever you use to open the business, the tax ID, EIN, or whatever, social, uh, it's got to match what's in it on the application. Uh, the account number and routing number at the bottom of your check, that's got to be able to accept ACH payments also. So um, I say that to say we can only, you can only make one submission for the targeted idle advance program. You, you got to be very careful when you uh, get ready to submit this information because if it's not correct, you're going to, your, your, package is going to be pushed to the back of the line and you may miss out. So I would always, I would say, make sure you get a second and third set of eyes on this package. Make sure, um, you know, someone outside of the um, senior team takes a look at it. If you have to go home and have someone that, you know, is thorough, take a look at it because it's kind of hard to see things through your own lens, right? Uh, if you're looking at it, it's perfect. It's always great, right? Someone else to take a look at it because here's some reasons you might fail. Uh, if the account name doesn't match the business name on the application, that's a no-no. If you change the business name since opening your account, that's a no-no, that's gonna be a red flag. If your personal account is being used for business, that's a red flag. Uh, or if the account's in someone else's name, like your spouse or your buddy, your friend, or what have you. Uh, or if you're reusing an account for multiple businesses and they, don't, and they don't match the name on the original application, that is a red flag. Um, if you have any questions on the applications, you, you can always go to targetedadvance at sba.gov. Uh, and if you're approved, you'll receive an email and a deposit, ACH deposit. Uh, to the bank account you you gave to us in the um, application for the targeted idle events. So again, you know, make sure your package is tight 
so that it doesn't get kicked back because if it gets kicked back, it goes to the back of the queue and there are going to be thousands, if not millions of people because, you know, the restaurant industry was hard as hit. Um, and, and, but that being said, the targeted idle advance, the folks on the idle side of the house, um, they were hit hard too. Um, and that's every industry. And so you want to make sure if you've been identified, you make sure you take the time to review your package and be as thorough as possible. So Shutter Been Your Operator's Grant is coming online here um, real soon. Matter of fact, I believe it comes online the 8th of May. And so um, all of these uh, eligible entities like the live venue operators, uh, museums, uh, zoos, aquariums, uh, talent reps, uh, theater producers and the like. Um, if you've been in business as of February 29, 2020, then you can apply for one of these grants. Uh, the maximum grant value is $10 million. Um, so again, if you are a shuttered venue operator, I advise you to go to our website and uh, I will have those websites. As a matter of fact, there are about four or five I will uh, go over with you when I get to the end of, uh, of the program. Um, and also, if you haven't already done so, and you're interested in the Shutter Venue Operator Grant, make sure you're uh, in our system for award management. You have a SAM profile established um, because in order to bid on a federal grant, you've got to have a profile established in SAM. Um, if you do that before you can complete that profile, you need to go to Dun & Bradstreet, get a Dun's number. That Dun's number is a nine digit locator that kind of pretty much just tells you um, it tells us where you are, where your location is. And if you have several locations, you probably have several different DUNS numbers, those different offices or locations. Um, then you go back to SAM, you complete the registration. They will then um, apply or submit to you a, what is called a CAGE code, C-A-G-E, and uh, where the DUNS number is a nine-digit uh, numeric uh, number. The Cage code is a five digit alphanumeric number and that cage code is used to pay you. So you wanna make sure you have that page code and Dunn's number and you can go ahead and follow and you can follow through and you'll be just fine. So um, forget the April 8th date on here. It's gonna be now May the 8th when the portal opens up and um, we're gonna move on to the next. So here are some new programs under the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the Supplemental Targeted Idle Advance Payment. Um, uh, we've got about $5 billion out there, and uh, there are gonna be $5,000 payments to those that are hardest hit. Eligibility is still being determined at this point in time, but you can go to sba.gov forward slash targeted advance to find out more about our Supplemental Targeted Idle Advance Payment Program. If you've been identified and you've received the Targeted Idle Advance, uh, then you don't have to worry about it. This is just for those who um, are hardest hit and uh, meet the criteria, you can, you can receive something from this fund. Um, Restaurant Revitalization Fund, uh, I won't call it a grant. It's not a grant, it's the RRF is what we're calling it. And uh, we've got $28.6 billion out there um, for this most, uh, gosh, Industry was destroyed, basically. I mean, because if you think about it, no one was going to uh, anybody's restaurant um, to eat or do anything else last year. So, but if you are a food truck operator, food cart, food stand, or caterer, uh, any restaurant, bar, brew, brew pub, uh, uh, brewery, any inn that uh, derives, you know, 33% of your proceeds from the sale of uh, food and spirits, or well, food and drink, or food and beverages, I apologize, then you are eligible for the RRF grant. Now, RRF is coming online real soon. Uh, matter of fact, Thrive, Friday, um, the system will open up and you can go in and take a look at uh, what is needed, what is necessary, pull the documents that you are gonna have to have. And on Monday, May 3rd, the system goes live for 21 days um, 
only those in the underserved communities. And that's something I, 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 and I, I should have mentioned earlier, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it now, uh, and that is our underserved community. Um, you know, we are tasked, this administration is focused like a laser on our underserved communities. So one of the things that we are focused on too is how do we support uh, people in our underserved communities? How we support small businesses in our underserved markets? Well, one of the things that this restaurant revitalization fund is going to do is it'll it's going to allow us to focus on underserved communities for the first 21 days of this fund. So the first 21 days, the focus is going to be on Hispanic, American, African American, uh, Native American, uh, to include Alaska Native and Native. Native Hawaiian owned or Hawaiian owned entities, um, subcontinent Asian uh, Americans and Pacific Asian Americans. So if you are in one of those social groups, uh, if you are a woman, if you are a veteran, we are going to focus on you. The first 21 days of this program, starting from May 3rd to May 24th, uh, the, we're going to focus like a laser on the smallest of small people. Even if you are engaged in a cash enterprise, like I can go home. I'm from St. Augustine, Florida. I can go home right now and I can go past, you know, three or four blocks where you got someone who's uh, got a food truck or a food cart on the side of the road and they sell every weekend. Well, they run a cash enterprise. They don't have uh, you know, Intuit QuickBooks. They don't have uh, an accountant or you know, someone to, to a bookkeeper to, to keep the books for them. Uh, they don't have, you know, compiled, reviewed, or audited financial statements, but they're in business. They have an enterprise. And so um, this, this new program is going to help them as well. The Community Navigators uh, program is coming online. That's going to be great for um, um, a lot of our smaller communities who are left out, our underserved communities. And what this uh, navigator program is going to do is um, is is help provide access and improve access to these COVID-19 programs and resources through our resource partner network and other partners. So there's going to be a lot of outreach conducted. Um, there's going to be a hotline. There's going to be a customer service help desk. And uh, and so this community navigator pilot program isn't a fund per se, a grant or a loan program, but what it will do is provide access to you and your organization to help others um, that have been left out, especially those who are, you know, part of grassroots community um, based organizations. Those are those are the ones we want to, want to help out uh, more than anyone else. So um, I think they, th those particular Entities offer um, offer a lot of support, and uh, and so that program is going to come online. Rosan talked about it already. She's the ditto. I'm the district office technical rep for the Women's Business Center, and I'm also the score liaison. Um, and uh, I may be uh, receiving some responsibility for the Small Business Development Center. Uh, the one of the project officers for the North Florida District Office. Uh, but there's no way we could do our job without these wonderful resource partners. They, uh, they're they where the rubber meets the road. They provide management and technical assistance for you all, uh, cost-free. Cost-free counseling and mentoring services from some of the best uh, mentors out there, counselors, some of the best uh, business analysts and consultants. So, uh, you know, you're lucky. You're, 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 you're lucky to have them. Uh, your tax dollars are hard at work. That being said, here's Rosalind's email address, um, rosalind.bryant at sba.gov. And then there's this, uh, this other guy here, this Thaddeus guy. Um, his is thaddeus.hammond at sba.gov. And that's Rosalind is R-O-S-A-L-I-N-D dot Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T at sba.gov. And Thaddeus's name is spelled T-H-A-D-D-E-U-S dot H-A-M-M-O-N-D at sb.gov. You can call us at 904-443-1900. They will patch you through to either one of us. My direct line is 1965. Rogers is 1906. 
Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Please write down the Twitter handle and, and send us your Twitter information so we can follow you. But we want you guys to follow us as many as possible. And here are our websites. Um, so um, you go to all of our economic aid options and programs. You can always go to www.spa.gov forward slash coronavirus relief. And that's going to give you all the programs with except PPP. If you want to find out about PPP, go to uh, www.sba.gov forward slash PPP. And um, you'll find information on the Paycheck Protection Program for IDLE. Uh, you'll find information on IDLE under uh, www.sba.gov forward slash IDLE or coronavirus relief. Uh, SBA.gov forward slash SBOG shuttered venue operator grant. And you can always go to www.sba.gov forward slash RRF for the restaurant revitalization fund. Or go to restaurants.sba.gov. Um, and uh, that, I think, will do it. Wow. And, uh, All I can say is wow right now. I'm, I'm wow. Wow, wow, wow. So hopefully the information is useful, is educational and beneficial to you all. And uh, uh, Ms. Teresa, I think uh, if you have a couple of questions, we can take a couple of questions. Of course, of course, we. I got, I got some questions for both of y'all, for both of y'all. Come on remember, in the room, Rosa. Teresa. Teresa. Sir. Well, one thing to keep in mind, and I'm sure Rosalyn will, will attest to this, and she'll probably say it while she's speaking. There are certain questions that may come up that we just simply cannot answer. Uh, we're restricted from answering. So uh, when those questions come up, we can't answer. Uh, we'll just let you know we can't answer. If we don't know the answer at this time, we will get the answer and get back to you. We're not going to just say, we, we're not going to pull something out of left field and say, yeah, well, this is it. Uh, but, but we'll get the right information to you <laughs> so there's no one talks about SBA in a bad way. <laughs> look, I'm not going to look. I promise. Trust me. I went through all these questions that I was emailed um, to make sure. But um, first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Thaddeus. That was um, very thorough, very informative. Even to answer some of my personal questions I had because um, I got a lot of information, too. And some questions I had, and you and Brosnan both overlapped and addressed all of them. So I want to make sure I addressed it that with you. I'm glad you talked about the opportunity zones because I think it kind of got lost. Really, the pandemic kind of got the opportunity zones lost. Mm -hmm. And there's so much misinformation going on about it because when I first heard about it, I started telling people, you know, you need to do the research. You need to understand. You need to make sure you're filling out your Census Bureau stuff because that has a lot to do with it, too. So you know where your track is for your property. But I'm not finna teach today. But I'm just telling <laughs> you and agreeing with both of you how important education is for a small business owner. And this is why I'm meticulous on topics I pick and guess that I bring on this platform because you all are the experts. Y'all been doing it a long time. So the first question I had, you touched on it when you mentioned about the, um, no, Roslyn, the building the relationship with the banks. Mm -hmm. And it was a question that you posed. You said, what would you need from me in order for me to do business with you? Correct. And I'm glad you broke down just because you have an account and you deposit and withdraw is not a definition of a business relationship. Correct. Now, I have came across um, this question has came up since the social unrest took place last summer. A lot of people are transitioning to black owned banks. That is a real hot topic that's going on, especially with some of my business owners that I affiliate with in Southeast Georgia. Are there any black owned lenders that participate in the SBA or uh, SBA service providers? Possibly. I don't know that um, okay. because uh, that is not something that I, I have looked into because usually, um, just so you know, we do not give we do not tell you what bank to go to it's up to you right right so that that wouldn't be something that i will um keep as a log say 
um, you participate with this bank, they are black dog on, go to them, they will do business with you. That would be an issue with, on the SBA side. What we gotcha. do, we provide the full list of lenders that we have done business with in the past for them mm -hmm. to use as a guide and then they can pick and choose. So for example, say if you have heard of a bank, so you will search our list to see if it's on there and then you'll gotcha. know whether or not they do business with us. That's usually how we do that. That way we'll keep anyone coming back and say we're showing favoritism to one bank from another. Right. So for any, um, then another question came from a person that's in um, a banking industry. Well, how do they go about being a preferred provider, not just with the North Florida district office, but with the SBA um, offices around the state, the nation? Well, they'll shoot me an email. That's the first okay. thing. So I will find out actually where their home office is located and that I will put them in connection with the lender relations specialist for that area. So it's just a, a certain documentation they would need to sign, read over and sign, and then we could start the process. Awesome. All right, Mr. Thaddeus, you talked about becoming certified. This process right here had my head scratching. I'm like, you know, I am Sam Gubb registered. Let me say that part. Let me put that there. And that was a process with that because it was during the time of the previous administration and a lot of staff wasn't employed in that department. That's what I learned later because I did everything they told me to do on the website, but I never received the confirmation was I actually registered until I had somebody, like you said, get another expert to look to see if you're doing it right. They went to check and it didn't show I was registered, but I knew I signed the paperwork in. So this sams.gov process, that's the first step. It would should that be the first step any startup or small business owner should do before they even thinking about getting certified or want to do business with the federal government? Well, in order to do business with the federal government, you must have a profile established in SAM. Yeah. So that is the first place. System for award management. But Remember, you got to have a DUNS number to complete the SAM registration. So I would go out and get a DUNS number, request it. You know, you can get the uh, link from us or just go to the website. But remember, Dun & Bradstreet is going to try and sell you everything under the sun when you go to them. You don't need them to monitor this or add that. All you need is a nine-digit DUNS number so you can do federal government contracting. That's all you got to say. They'll send it to you. You add it to your profile, and you're set from there. And then the process starts in terms of, you know, building relationships and understanding what your target market is and partnerships and alliances and all that good stuff. Awesome. That that's good to know. And I do have my Dunn's number. I, that that was up. But the thing of it is that I've learned is that startups and small business owners are not having the patience to do this stuff, Mr. That is. Right. I, I wouldn't pay them. Come to us or our procurement technical assistance center specialist or PTAC. They will help you do it for free. Don't pay anybody because people out there charging $5,000 to do all this stuff. Come to us or come to the PTAC at the SBDC and they will do it. If you have a question about the technical support for SAM, there's a technical support arm, a help desk called the Federal Service Desk, www.fsd.gov. That's where you go if you have a question. If you're trying to apply, uh, get your registration in SAM, um, your profile established and you run into problems, don't call us, don't call the PTAC, call the Federal Service Desk. They've got a number and a website. So, and I can provide that later if you like. That would be great. Um, my next question, um, the Hub Zone program. Mm -hmm. What about, I, I mean, you talked about, you and Rosen both talked about um, the business being bank ready and being certified to do business with the government. But what about service industry businesses like consultants and they most of them are home-based businesses probably prior to the pandemic and even much so more now how can they take advantage of the hub zone program to be able to get those economic um tax credits that's available to them well you know the hub zone program just like any of our other federal government contracting programs is predicated on relationships right okay. you can get the certification that doesn't guarantee you you're going to get some work. Uh, as I stated, we buy everything from Apple to xylophones. If you're in the service industry, if you make it, if you produce it or what have you, we're going to buy it. 
It's just a matter of establishing the relationships with the customer that you you feel is the best for you and your target market. So um, I would just say, make sure once you get the SAM registration, you want to go into a hub zone. If you, if your principal place of business is located in the hub zone, first of all, 35% of your employees reside in the hub zone, then you can focus on marketing to the government. And uh, if you're a hub zone firm, the government loves, they would love to talk to you because they have not met the hub zone goals of federal government contracting. And I've been doing this for many years and they have not mm. met the goal for hub zone yet. 3% hey. goal. So if you identify yourself as a hub zone firm, guess what? They're more likely to do business. If you have hub zone, 8A woman on or service disabled, now the federal government gets credit for doing business with all of those entities under one. Wow. So if you're a hub zone and woman on, that's a plus for the government. Um, I always tell people start marketing them in, in March and April and May because they're going to make their um, buying decisions in June, July, because they've got to use funds. If they don't use it, they're going to lose it. And if they know they've got a hub zone out there, home, hub zone firm they can do business with, then you're good. Awesome. That's good. Hmm. Got me thinking. Something to think yeah. about. Now, yeah. you talked about um, Roslyn. It was a question you talk about bank ready um, when you was going over the five C's and you were talking about character and you was talking about credit. And I get this question asked me a lot, a lot of times. Personal credit. Now, we know we in a pandemic and a lot of folks either lost income, couldn't pay bills. They probably got extensions. What would you advise small business owners and startups right now who credit score has been impacted? That's going to impact that five that C in the five C's for them to be bank ready? Well, for one, for, for SBA, I want to speak on the SA, SBA part. Our, the credit score or the credit, your, your credit score is very low, what is required to do business with SBA and for SBA to move forward. Now, majority of our lenders, they do have their own in-house credit score that they will work with. That's really up to them. We can't tell them that. But as far as our programs, I think our score is like a six something. Okay. That we will okay. we will accept applications and move forth with it. But I would have them pull their credit report for one to make sure nothing fraudulent is on there. That's the right. first thing um, during this time because there's a lot of that is going on as well. And then just look at everything, just just make note of it and, and, and justify everything. When when they go out to receive funds to folks, um, you know you have issues on your credit report. Don't let it just sit there. Let someone know what's going on. Say it's out there. Call the creditors and let them and ask them, hey, is there something I could do? Is something the small payments I could pay towards this, whether it's five or ten dollars to keep you from reporting? Reporting it as being unpaid. That's a good, good, good answer. Great. Now, with the IRS backlog processing tax return, and I know the tax filing deadline has been extended to May 17th. And I know you said being bank ready, bank ready you and Mr. That is that we got to have our financial statements and all this stuff in order. But if individuals who've all filed 2019 tax returns and they have not been processed yet, and they can't get the IRS for 4056 form. What's what's the next option? Just as long as they show that they have filed for an extension or the extension is out there and they have filed, that usually that shouldn't be an issue on issue on our end. Okay. Again, we can't speak for a bank. We we know that there are issues out there. We know that the IRS is backlog. So with that being said, if say a bank submits a pack, again, remember, you do business with the bank, the bank does business with us. So it's going to be on that bank to justify why they don't have certain documentations for us to move forth. So if they put on there the applicant, I do have in file where the applicant has received an, an additional extension to this or um, IRS, um, they have submitted it to IRS but have not received the information by, that is the justification for us to move forth. And then first thing before closing or before you disperse these funds, you must have this in file. That's how we move forth on our end. But again, that's SBA. 
we understand all of that. Again, SBARS, we're both federal, so we understand what's going on there. But I can't speak if a lender may say, hey, if you don't have it, we don't want to do business with you. OK, now you must want to you may want to go to a different lender that will actually uh, work with you justified and move forward. OK. All right. I got one last question. I think this one might be for Mr. Thaddeus. If you if a business previously applied for the PPP loan or the Eli, the um, economic <laughs> injury disaster loan grant, can they apply again? I remember you. I like the way you broke um broke down about the advance that they gave. If you didn't qualify for the ten thousand dollars, so they gave you a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or whatever, based on the number of employees. If you applied under um before, can you apply again? That's my first question. And the part two of that question, if you have more than one business in two different states, can each business apply? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, you can only apply as an idle loan once. PPP, you can do it twice. And if you got multiple, I had a lady in daycare. As long as you have different EINs for each one, you can apply for each one of those entities. Okay. Because I know that want, question. Rosalind, let Rosalind add, because that's her, that's her, that's her territory. Okay. Before I go to PPP on the PPP, the idle, um, that is, you could talk about, say, because she say, I know you only can apply once, but as far as um, the reconsideration side, if they get denied, can they re reconsider? Can they submit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, can, you, you, can, you can submit an app uh, or a uh, packet for reconsideration if you were denied the idle loan. That's not a, it's not a different idle loan, but um, if they deny you for either credit reasons or unverifiable information or what have you, you can write um, a synopsis of, you know, what the issue was, how you resolved the issue, provide the 4506T, uh, here's that form again, it, and whatever <laughs> documentation necessary, send it to PDC consideration, and uh, and they will reconsider the request, and then you may you may receive the funding, but, but the, Actual application only once, but you okay. have PPP Correct. first and second job. Uh, Rosalind, like I said, that's Rosalind, Rosalind's territory. And okay. as far as the PPP, um, as you know, the first round that was, we called the PPP one, they applied. So now if you receive the first round funding, now you're applying for the PPP, the second round funding. So yes, you can have two PPP loans out there. And you can also have a PP, two PPP loans and a EIDL loan. So you can have actually all three loans. So with the P, so there, okay, because I want to um, dispel this misconception. Some folks, they thinking the um, Eli loan was a grant, especially if they got the, but according oh. to what I heard today from Mr. Thaddeus, that's that targeted advance where they got that money. And they didn't have to pay it back. There is an there is a grant portion to the idle, which is the advance, the original advance last year, okay. that between one thousand and ten thousand, based on number of employees. That's the grant part. The loan itself is still a loan, thirty year terms, three point seven five percent or two point seven five percent for nonprofits. Got it. That's that's because um I heard that a lot, and I'm like, no, that don't sound right, y'all. I say, y'all, government don't get no free money. Don't expect to get it back unless they're telling you they're giving it to you. <laughs> Well, well, the PPP loan, that is a forgivable loan. So yeah. it's possible that you can get up to the amount that you are approved for and it will be forgiven by okay. the government. Um, and then, but you go through and then it's, it, you may be partially forgiven. As long as you use the money correctly, paycheck, 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 paycheck protection loan. So you have to use it to be paying your employees for the paycheck protection. <laughs> so if you use it properly on the in the percentages that they allow, it may be forgiven where you can say it was the money that they gave you to continue to operate. However, if you do not, if you cannot justify it and show, show the receipts and show your 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 invoices, how you use the funds correctly, then SBA may say, hey, they didn't use all this money or they got $100,000. They only use uh, $50,000 correctly. The other $50,000, now it turns into a loan. That 1% loan, you're going to have to repay. Okay. Now, one more. Mr. Thaddeus said something about the Schedule C filers. 
And I'm glad you cleared this up because this was a little confusing for me and I never could get a straight answer. About you talking about that line 31 and the last. I said, Oh God, here he go. Schedule C filers who do not make any profit. So they looking at your gross revenue that you make, not your net profit. Is am I correct? That's okay, why so they made a change. Okay, because there weren't there were a lot of people not qualified when you look at line 31, the net. But then when you look at the gross receipts, oh wow. Because they've got business expenses, right? And so now you look right. at line seven and they qualify under line seven. So yeah, that's why they made the change. So you could qualify more people or, or have more people become eligible. Rosalind, you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> so if yeah. the schedule yeah. wait, so if the schedule C filers were denied on PPP round one, they if they reapply this time, would they be eligible? You can't go back. The form is not retroactive. Remember, I said that the form is not retroactive. So it's having me a whole new thing. And, and if you can't go to, you can go to the bank and say, "Hey, you know what? I want to change. I want to use a Schedule C." If they've already processed that loan, you can't it's get it sure. back to, to uh, get a note. Got it. So that's why you have to know all the facts before you do. For you, file. I see what you're talking about now. I see. Now the um. I love the new initiatives that's coming out in the grant, and I'm I'm glad they opening up the opportunity for um, the underserved communities to get first opportunities at the funding um, starting May third. Um, but I, you said something about those that didn't have the actual financial records or formal stuff. What would be acceptable for them to apply? Well, right now we're working on that. So so stay tuned. Send me that question. Rosalind may know the answer. Um, I don't have it right now. Um, we're still working on that and they will let us know. But, but, but just know this. If you're on a cash business, we're going to help you too. Yeah, and that's right. those people that run a cash enterprise. You know, I was just saying, I didn't want to, well, I go to the hood right now and I go <laughs> to the corner, right? And you know, I got my partners on the corner has got that food truck been there for 20 years. He's running a cash enterprise. Right. Right. You know? So I agree. We, we want to help as many of those that want to be helped. You know, some of them don't want to be helped, but uh, some of them need to help. Right. right. Okay, and now, I think, go ahead, Rossi. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think we should kind of wait before answering that question because, again, it is new. So right. when they start registering, folks going to come and they're going to say, well, oh, this is what I got. But is and then we they're gonna review it and say okay that's that's the legal documentation so then they're gonna say oh you can also use this you can use this so I think it, it, again it's a new program so they're they're step by step so just like with the PPP with the EIDL some stuff they kind of um said okay well, now we're gonna use this they'll come back and amend it but you got to wait till they amend it so it's kind of hard for us to say you can use something differently than what's actually posted until they say so. Right. So note to small business owners and startups, keep your stuff in order. Keep your revenue, your expenses, keep it in order. So when they do tell us what the criteria is, y'all will be ready to put that information in on whatever template or form requirement that the SBA require. Now, startup grind might be curious about this question and some of my um, startup grind directors about the shutter venue operation grants, because before the pandemic, we used to have in-person events. Um, and like my partnership in Jacksonville was with the Jacksonville Zoo. And when the pandemic hit, the zoo shut down and we had to go virtual. So some of them are going back into in-person events. Um, Startup Grind Jacksonville will not, not at this time, but maybe in the future. So I'm curious with what we do as a community of educating um, entrepreneurs and bringing them together in an in-person event. What what we qualify for shelter um venue operation grants? Because I know I'm not the only organization. Startup Grind is not the only community that holds monthly events or hosts monthly events, whether it's on a social basis or ec educational basis or networking basis. Is there a specific criteria for that? Because I look under live venue operators and promoters that's probably about the one i see where startup grind community would fit am i right or wrong well they are still writing the rules to that and okay. because the grant program i really can't weigh in on it um 
Unfortunately, because Roz and, I, and myself were government employees, this is going to be a government competition. So you're going to have to submit a bid, ah. a request for a proposal. You got to submit a bid for this particular grant. In order to be awarded the grant, you got to go. That's why you have to have a SAM profile, and you have to you go through all that stuff in order to submit this bid to the government for the grant. So I, you know, I can't talk about what the rules are and can't be whatever you see on the website that all i can tell you is you can go to the website but we can't talk about what the rules could be or or, or what they are so they haven't determined whether you had to be for profit or non-profit you can be a yeah. non-profit and for profit gotcha that, that's all look that's enough for me i will i'm a reader i will go out there and read but i was just yeah. curious when you was um sharing that and i was reading your um statements from that because i know some of the other individuals who do events uh, you know up, back up back up, back up if i'm not mistaken rosin help me on this one you got to be for profit you got to be one of those entities that was listed um zoos aquariums Correct. and all the like you got to be a for-profit enterprise they, yeah. they list it there and and just so you know therese that that is one of the reason why um when we talk about the, the this program and the restaurant program it's kind of unclear because right. we're trying to provide the information to you without just saying go and read it, got it. <laughs> but we want to provide some kind of overview of it so but it's certain things that we can go into because we don't want no one to come back and say, hey, they got it before we got it or they gave them something or they approved them before I got approved because we want right. everybody to be on equal ground and to apply. So that's why everything that you need, any count, any count, the, um, whether or not you're approved, whether or not you're eligible or not, everything. Go to the website that's why we provided that website you go to it's self-explanatory there and if it's not then they have um, resources for you to talk to it's out of the district hands outside of that because we don't want someone to say what well, north florida district gave start a grind all this good information and we didn't never get it so that is why we kind of it's kind of unclear and we're kind of hesitant of what we're saying about those um programs so Right. I understand. So let me clarify and be specific for our listeners now and who going to watch this replay. Start, SBA North Florida District Office is operating in person or virtually. How are you all servicing the community members? Say that again. In reference In other words, to can someone come visit the office or they no, have to do everything through virtually. phone or e Okay. We are virtually. Okay. So you can, um, that's why we provided our email address. Um, Thaddeus and I provided the telephone number. You can call 904-443-1900. That is our district office. Anyone who answered that telephone should be able to provide assistance to you. However, you can ask for myself or Thaddeus, but as you know, we are all overwhelmed. So I prefer emails. I really do because I can read your email. If it's something that I can gather the information and send back to you, I probably would do that quicker than picking up the telephone. And then we kind of wasting a little more time than me answering your um, your call. However, anyone should be able to provide the assistance to you. So don't just call and say, let me speak to Roz and let me speak to Thaddeus because it may be one or two days before you get your answer where the person answering that phone may can answer your question and you can kind of resolve the issue at all. That's good. That's good to know. So I want to take this time to thank Mr. Thaddeus and Ms. Rosalyn. I know they are very, very busy. They have spent this quality time with Startup Grind this <laughs> afternoon. And I know it took a lot and I'm not going to hold them no longer. I just want to let you all know that Ms. Rosalyn Bryant and Mr. Thaddeus Hammond said you can reach them at 904-443-1900. And if you're not in the North Florida, Jacksonville, Florida area, there there is a SBA office in your area. You need to go to sba.gov and you check out the location where you are. And as Rosalind and Mr. Thaddeus told you both, you have to build the relationships.
You have to be real in relationships to get the access and the opportunities with the federal government. Just want to let you know, funding month is still going on. We hold it on strong to the end of this month. Tomorrow at 2 p.m., we'll be talking with um, Serena. She is a world-renowned uh, expert in taking advantage of what Mr. Thaddeus talked about, that AA government contracting. She's going to talk about redefining federal contracting, how to succeed in the federal marketplace. See, Mr. Thaddeus and Rosalind told you about their resource partners to give you counseling and give you mentoring. Serena, our speaker tomorrow, actually helps you with the logistical, how to navigate through all that counseling and, and logistic uh, and uh, mentoring that you will get from these resource partners. Cause there's always a part two to getting this information. And then that night we are co-hosting with our North Florida, I mean, our South Florida chapter in Fort Lauderdale with Johnny Price, the VP of fundraising, a WeFunder. So at this time, I just want to give kudos and shout out to Mr. Thaddeus Hammond, Ms. Ross and Brian for sharing so much knowledge today. I think I, I don't wrote on about two legal pads worth of notes. So when you watch this replay, you need to make sure you have pen and pad in hand. They give you so much information, but they have agreed to share the PowerPoint slides with me and I will be more than happy to share it with you. And please don't be stingy share it with others so they can take opportunity of this opportunity with the federal government there is enough money and room at the table for all of us so let's each one help one now mr thaddeus and miss rosa y'all get the last words before we sign off today thank you thanks for having us have a nice one and stay safe thank you for having us look forward to talking to you Thank you. All right. You both stay safe and you all have a good evening. And thank you again from Start of Grind Jacksonville. Take care. Funding Month, presented with Oracle for Startups and American Express, recognizes the stories, lessons learned, and best practices shared by founders and funders around the world.